Good afternoon, everybody. And uh, thank you for, for coming out today. We appreciate it. It's uh, great to get such a, a good attendance. Um, we can probably give it one more minute. We'll kind of roll up slowly because people are still joining, it looks like. Yeah, we'll give it another 60 seconds. So all of our panelists can wave and say hello. Um, they've hello. prepared a wrap that they're going to do, you know, as an opening act. No? Barbershop Quartet? Improv comedy? None of the above. All right. Well, Sounds like it's just you, Randy. <laughs> it's just me. No problem. All right, good. Well, so I um, want to thank you all for joining today. Um, I think as many of you know in, in the audience, we try to do these webinars at Orthogonal about once a month to cover, uh, really bring together industry experts around different interesting pressing topics in the SAMD space. Um, we don't take it for granted that you're giving us an hour in the middle of a day. January and early February seem to be particularly crazy this year for everybody. So we we really appreciate your time. We're going to try to make the most of it. Our goal is to basically cram about four hours of content and gold nuggets into a much smaller space of time. Um, today, we're talking about what's under the QMS umbrella, making informed early decisions about which software falls under design controls. This is not a new topic, but at some point in 2023, it started becoming for us one of the topics that in different ways was coming up in conversations with every company and with, with pretty much everybody in the med tech industry of where do I know how to draw the lines on, on my design controls these days? Because with software, it's getting really complicated and, and less binary. Um, so we wanted to pull together some people for this. Uh, Quick reminder, we will be posting this on YouTube if you missed it or you want to pass it along. And within a week or so, we will get a summary blog up as well. Um, really, our goal for you, give you an interactive discussion, have you leave with some really good gold nuggets. Today's a, a discussion among the panel. Um, so we're going to try and take questions throughout. We already have some questions from people that were submitted before and that we've incorporated in. But just keep them coming in the chat, please, and we'll do them. Our promise to you is it's, it's noon here, Eastern time. By 12.50 p.m. today, we will have covered the core content that we've promised you. So that is that is our promise to you. However, if you have more questions, we can stick around up to another 40 minutes. So until 1.30 Eastern time. Occasionally, we go that long. But I will say um, it's pretty amazing usually. I think about 40% of our attendees usually stick around for the full time. So we we can stand, stay on and answer questions for a long time afterwards. Um, and just a couple words about orthogonal. I don't even like doing this, but people say it's weird when you invite them to a webinar and you don't even tell them who you are. So um, orthogonal is a, a software development firm. We help uh, accelerate patient outcomes faster. The way we do it is by working with companies building medical device software to accelerate the development of software as a medical device, connected device systems, and digital therapeutics. And the way that we help them accelerate is by sort of taking the best of modern product management and software engineering that have um, been so effective in so many other industries uh, in the last 20, 30 years, and figuring out a way to apply them to the med tech context in our, in our traditional focus on safety and effectiveness as sort of embodied by regulation and compliance in a way that it's a lot more than just, oh, we're lean and agile and do great stuff, but don't worry, we're still compliant. We actually believe that the modern techniques for software and product development um, that are developed in other industries, when merged in an intelligent way, can fundamentally raise the bar on safety and effectiveness in this industry and take us to a whole new level. So uh, with all of that, I am going to uh, let our panelists introduce themselves. Even by our standards, I'm really proud. I think we've got a killer panel today, just awesome people and some really different points of view. And what I'll say, if I had to characterize our prep call, it was different than other ones because it was almost feisty, um, A, in terms of kind of the sense of humor and banner back and forth, but also really in terms of the panelists coming back to me and saying, no, no, Randy, you're asking the wrong question or kind of, you know, it, it was, it was um, it's interesting. This is a dynamic topic, so I think it's be good. So we'll go in alphabetical order here. Uh, Beth. I was wondering what letter you were going to use as the beginning of the alphabet. So. <laughs> Um, I'm Elizabeth George. I have done uh, medical device regulations, quality, and standards work forever. I'm not even going to say how many years because then you'll realize I'm way older than I should be to be on uh, technology still. But um, I'm very excited to be involved in this. I've worked uh, globally 
with all the regulators from around the world and uh, have been involved in the software and AI, et cetera, since um, people started talking those words. So um, I'm excited to be here, and I presently am uh, affiliated with Orthogonal as a regulatory fellow for them, as well as having my own consulting business. Excellent. Brendan. Thanks, Randy. My name's Brendan O'Geary. Uh, my background's in engineering. I spent uh, 14 years with the Food and Drug Administration and helped uh, launch the Digital Health Center of Excellence there and worked on an awful lot of software policies and, and precedents. Um, and since last April, I'm a digital health technology and regulatory strategy consultant. Coming up on a year. Clay. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Clay Anselmo. I have been doing quality assurance and regulatory affairs and medical devices, combo products for more than 30 years. And I'll just leave it at that, like, like Beth. Um, for about 17 years in, in the middle of my career, I, I built and ran a, a large quality and regulatory consulting company called Regulera. And today I, I mostly do sort of complicated um, either quality management system builds or pre-market submissions for um, mostly software enabled products. I've, as like Beth said, I've been involved in AI ML products sort of since they, they started to uh, come through the medical device processes and um, yeah, I'm an engineer by education. Excellent. Um, so we're going to start out with a couple of basic questions for each of you, and then we'll kind of move to more of an interactive discussion, but jump in at any point. And like I said, for the audience, um, please submit your questions early and often. They make our, uh, they make the conversation much more interesting. So Brandon, you know, as we say, it used to be devices were sort of not as simple, but it was, they had very clear boundaries. You know, who was a device maker and who wasn't? You know where a device began and where it ended, right? You knew when you were done with your device and you put it to market and you say, okay, my, my device is fixed, it's done. Um, you knew if you were building a device, you were probably a device company. You were not going to be a consumer electronics company <laughs> who decided, yeah, I'll dabble a little bit in device. That's all changed. Every one of the things I just named seems to have gotten a lot more fuzzy. Um, and there's this, there's this interesting world. And so it's a basis for how to think about doing design controls and quality in this much more muddied world of where where is my device and where isn't it or what what contributes to safety and effectiveness for my device. Um, I believe you were involved uh, about four years ago when the FDA published uh, guidance on multifunction device products, policy and considerations. I looked up the official document name. And I think that's a really good basis to start for this conversation because this is really where, where we all begin. How do we parse out a world where, where things are mixed in? So could you maybe just give us a little background on what that is conceptually and what the problems we're solving and kind of what the what the uh, the building blocks are of it? Sure. Well, historically, there's a awful lot of complexity to untangle there uh, that you just referenced, right? Going all the way back to notions like what was previously called the accessory rule, where there was this concept that if you were going to hook a medical device up to another product, that other product might also become a medical device. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that was probably never quite true, um, but I think that the multiple functions guidance and other efforts around it, starting in the early 2010s at the FDA, were really working to deal with this notion of we have a more interconnected world in terms of how our products work. Um, and we have to be able to hook our medical devices up to other technologies if we're going to experience the full benefits of those medical devices. And then ultimately, we're going to have to be able to incorporate medical device functionality into products that themselves would not otherwise be medical devices if we're going to have the, the best possible outcomes uh, for, for patients. So the multiple functions device products guidance gets at those issues. Like most great FDA guidances, it starts with the concept of intended use. Um, like like most FDA regulatory concepts start with. And a, a function is a distinct purpose of a product or a distinct intended use of a product. And a multiple function device product is a product that has functions that meet the definition of a medical device, things that are intended for use in the diagnosis, treatment, cure, management, prevention of a disease, or intended to affect the structure or function of the bottom, body, or um, it has other functions, things that aren't medical device intended uses uh, put together. And this guidance is at the intersection of policy and architecture in the sense that it, it essentially says, if you do a good job designing your product, um, architecting your product so that the device functions and the other functions are not overly convoluted, 
And if you do a, an impact assessment to show that they are not overly convoluted and that um, issues with your other functions aren't going to affect the safety or effectiveness of your device functions in the context of their use, then FDA, um, as a regulator, can mostly ignore your other functions and really just focus its review and its regulatory activities on the device functions of your product. And this is really important if you're developing a product that's going to have both device functions and other functions, because you may not necessarily want to spend a lot of time dealing with regulators uh, crawling through documents related to functionality that is not core to the intended use of your medical device itself. Um, so that's, that's really the problem the guidance tries to solve and the overall structure in which it tries to solve it. Excellent. So in, it sounds like you really envisioned when you were doing this sort of a full range of, of the ratio of device to non-device, anything from an MRI that might have a couple of non-device functions to a smartwatch that has a ton of consumer functions and wellness, but one algorithm on top, it's a device. Those were sort of all envisioned under this kind of framework? Absolutely. You know, the FDA has enough to do um, <laughs> without uh, spending a lot of time worrying about uh, data storage, for example, or other non-device functions um, in these products. They really want to be able to focus their attention on the areas where they can have the most benefit um, in terms of how they help patients. Thank you. All right. So, Clay, let me turn to you, somebody who has been a... Um, I think probably a heavy consumer of this guidance <laughs> and been in applying it methods. Let's take it and scale it up to much more large and complicated ecosystems where now it's not just a single device with a single feature, but there's a lot of integrated healthcare and other things going on. So this is anything from, um, you know, uh, integrating your device with multiple hospital systems to integrating your device with other of your devices to other of other people's devices. Um, EHR systems and PACS integration. I just had a list here. Telehealth software, clinical decision support that's not a device, uh, consumer fitness and wellness apps, um, systems that you know might be in the full life cycle, something like surgical planning and then post-surgical monitoring, all these things. What do you do with that multifunction when you scale it up now to a much more complicated ecosystem? It's a good question, right? Um, it, it, it... We have historically always had this idea that the word product equaled device. And now we have sort of changed the level of abstraction to say within a product, we have device functions and we have non-device functions and they interact through a set of interfaces, right? We always had the concept that a, a product might have external interfaces and it might take data from another device product. Uh, and we have this uh, interoperability guidance document from FDA that talks about how we do that. We have always had external interfaces to non-device products where maybe data comes in or information um, that is used by the regulated device function, but the source of it itself is not a device, right? So this gets back to what Brendan was saying about architecture and, and architecting an ecosystem and having <laughs> an ecosystem roadmap. But what ends up happening is the lines of what defines a product in an ecosystem get very blurry right? Uh, especially when we're talking about SAMD products and not embedded software with hardware. And so I guess the trick to, the trick for me and, and, and when, I've, when we've tried to solve these kind of problems is to define an architecture that says these are the discrete products. Within those products, these are the functions that are regulated. These are the interfaces within the product, between the functions within the product, and these are the external interfaces both to other devices and to non-regulated devices. And once you've defined that architecture, perform a risk assessment that helps you look at how to best des design and develop it so that you can actually isolate the non-device and the device pieces. Because conceptually, and we've done this forever, though to the extent that we can separate external and even now internal functional interfaces, and isolate them so they don't adversely affect the device functions, we're able to limit the risk of the device. We're able to communicate it more clearly to FDA. Um, we're able to focus our risk mitigations, our design verification validation activities to those things that really matter. So it starts with architecture. It starts with product definition. It starts with interface definition, both within the product and across products, then goes to risk assessment, risk mitigations, 
And ideally, if you've got a decent architecture, like, like Brandon, Brandon said, you can, a lot of these things FDA doesn't care about. And you can focus on those things that, that really matter. It's a lot easier said than done. And it's really hard to apply to devices that weren't designed for isolating device functions and non-device functions. If the architecture's messy, this gets to be very messy. So if you start with technical debt, <laughs> you, you, you're... It, it's hard. I mean, it's really hard. You, you know, there are many devices that we, products that we consider devices as a whole product that have non-device functions. But to go back now and try to split them and separate them because the architecture didn't contemplate isolation, it, it's difficult. It's difficult. So one other um, kind of use case I'll throw out, which is sort of in the, it, it's it's related, but it's a, it's sort of a cousin, which is a lot of organizations now, this is sort of every industry, are figuring out that data is a strategic asset. You want to treat it as an asset and not as just some stuff you have on tapes that you go find. And are realizing, gee, we have all this clinical data and all this other data. If we're strategic about collecting it now, maybe down the road, we could do some really neat things with it that we hadn't anticipated, kind of like a library. You know, you don't know what you're going to learn at the library. Um, so we're going to start collecting all this data now. But, gee, if we're going to collect all this data, let's just say it's sort of a data warehouse, right? We have this unified enterprise place for all of our clinical data. What do we have to do when we're building and running that thing so that that data will be FDA grade when it comes time to figure out, oh, we, those, now those are the data elements. We didn't know which ones, but these are the ones we're going to use for our algorithm, which will go into a device. Do you, I mean, do you essentially have to run an entire data warehouse under design controls as if it's, you know, device grade, so to speak? Device grade. Wow. I hate those terms, Randy. Like now, now we're going to hear that forever. That's like, that's like, it's, it's a medical grade PC, right? And we, I pull my hair out whenever I hear this. You, you got to come up with your own term then. Uh, yeah. no. Look, at, at the end of the day, if you have a mental model for how you might use that data, and it might be involved in, for example, machine learn a machine learning product in the future, like some basic controls on that data are absolutely necessary because we, we, we need to be able to show, and, and FDA has done a nice job in the CAD E guidance document when it talks about databases and training uh, AI ML algorithms of, of giving you a, a mental model for, look, if you collect it, you should store it in a way that preserves its integrity. You should know who can access it, what was done with it. You should have a set of roles for people and be able to prove that it wasn't inadvertently modified or used in a way that you're unaware of that's going to introduce bias into products in the future. Okay. That doesn't mean that you, it has to be some gigantic clinical trial data management system, but some basic controls. We've got part 11, right? It, these end up being a, a electronic record in the quality system. So, you know, access controls, uh, um, backup and restore audit trails some of the basic stuff is is required now if you're if you when you start to develop use cases for it though then you've got to think about it in terms of what are you going to do with it and and how do you demonstrate to a regulatory agency or even to yourself that you haven't modified this data or used this data in a way that your future uses are are and the product that's going to result from it are compromised and you know, I don't like the term clinical data management, but but it's probably case data management because some of this stuff might come from phantoms. It might come from other sources, but uh, you, you need to think about a reasonable management system and a mental a clinical data management is a reasonable mental model. Uh, what we would do for collecting, for example, electronic clinical trial data. I'm not sure it's all directly applicable, but it's a it's a reasonable mental model. But don't do something to this data, for example, like uh, check it out, modify it, check it back in and overwrite the source data and then have no record of it, right? I mean, these are just bad data management practices. Having them stored on a server where every, every person in development can get to them and modify them is just bad data management practices. So, you know, if you intend to use it, you should control changes, you should control who has access to it, and you should keep track of what was done to it. Um, or conversely, I, where every database is one, it's thrown up by an individual developer and in another, another. Yeah, estimate. or sits on their PC with no, I mean, that's just, forget the regulatory framework. That's just bad data management practices, right? 
Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know. I don't think it's, I don't think it's that hard. I think we have mental models for how to do it. And I, but it does take some vision for the future of what that data might be worth. Beth, so you spent many years at a top five global med tech firm. And I always thought like, if you had a coat of arms, it would say anything you do, I do, but it's way more complicated, right? <laughs> I actually looked up yesterday, how many countries are there in the world? And depending on how you're counting, it's almost 200 right now um, from, a, from a legal point of view. You And you, you've worked on devices that have probably gone to almost 200 of them, right? So- yeah. So what happens to all this conversation when we start saying, oh, yeah, it's just FDA. That That's cute. But, you know, now let's talk about EU, UK, Australia, Japan, China, Singapore, you know, on and on and on. Um, how, how does that change this whole conversation we've had? So first off, I'm going to say the famous words that regulatory people always say. Well, it depends. Um, and we always say that. And the reason we always say that is, it depends on the risk level. It depends on the complexity. It depends on where it's being manufactured. It depends on where it's being distributed to. Um, so there's all of those decisions have to be made. But I think just like Brendan and Clay just mentioned is there's some good business logic that you have to take into consideration. So think about what you're going to be doing. Think about where you're going to be marketing. Um, a, as a regulatory person, when my marketing person told me, oh, we're only selling in the U.S., I would have the BS alarm went off instantaneously because I knew that three seconds after we distributed it in the United States, every other country in the world was going to be calling us going, when's it ready? When's it ready? So you have to think about from an architecture standpoint, from a business standpoint, what is your plan? Where are you headed? Why are you going there? But I think the other thing that you have to remember is, particularly when we're talking about software, um, we were just talking about, you know, is it a medical device or not? Well, guess what? Things that are not a medical device presently in the United States, electronic medical record is a great example. It's managed by an organization, ONC. Historically, it wasn't managed by anybody for some companies, for other companies, like the one that I worked for, we actually did a 510K for our electronic medical record. Um, and that was 30 plus years ago we did it. Um, so, you know, in the way, way, way back machine. But in Europe, it is a full-blown medical device. It, it's at least a 2A, could be a 2B medical device. In Japan, for a while, they used to say, hmm, what is that? Uh, it's only software. We don't care. Well, guess what? Now it's becoming a lot more interesting for them. So you have to have those discussions. You know, is it or isn't it a medical device? What jurisdiction are you send it, selling it in? I know Brendan mentioned intended use. Well, some people use those words other places as well, but also it's practice of medicine. The practice of medicine is different in all of those countries. So, you know, when you mention the 200 countries, I always say, so it's 200 countries, but that's probably four to 500 regulations that you have to follow to get the product into that the, around the world if you're planning on doing it because of who you're having to deal with. And, the, you know, some countries it's, at FDA or their counterparts, other countries, it's the pharmaceutical people you have to deal with. There's that whole mix and match of, of what it is and who has involvement. Um, and then the other thing that's happening uh, as all people involved in regulatory, so everybody on this call would be aware of this, is, is that every country that has a regulation is changing it. And every country that doesn't have a regulation is creating their own. And everybody claims they're using International Medical Device Regulators Forum as their framework. Um, again, the BS alarm goes off a little bit. They use the, some of the terms. They reference it. They pretend to embrace it. But they all modify it. So 
you know, when it comes down to trying to deal with it, um, it, it, there's a lot of things that have to be considered, but understanding and defining your architecture up front, deciding what your business plan is and your business model is, um, most of this should be just good common sense, good common business practices to follow. And oh, by the way, guess what? The quality management system, you know, you talk to management, you have a training program, you have document management, you have records management. It tells you to have continuous improvement, which means think about standards and all of those. So it's just all good business sense. So um, I, it, you know, I, I, I go back to that. It depends. It varies how much you have to do based on the risk of the product. And, and I know Clay brought that up as well. And I think that, you know, I make it sound simple. It's not, unfortunately. It, it, it's, it's simple if you engage your regulatory people at the concept, not when you're getting ready to distribute. Okay, so I'm going to throw out a question. This was the one that started the feistiness yesterday, so I'll just ask it the same way and let you all go. So do we just need like a QMS light or a design control light? To, uh, to, you know, for like the stuff that's not device, like, so we'll, we'll do the stuff we decide is a device. We'll do that under full QMS. And the other stuff we'll just sort of do like a, you know, a simpler version, you know, the freemium version. So um, I'll jump in and, and start by endorsing something that Clay said earlier um, about not necessarily liking the concept of, uh, you know, device grade as a term for example, right? And I think a lot of times when you talk about QMS versus QMS Lite versus some other type of framework, um, you're, you're bringing up a similar sort of concept that we can have one standard of quality uh, for one type of product and another standard of quality for another type of product. And I don't think that it's quite so categorical. Um, I think that we, we need our products to be fit for purpose. Um, some of those purposes are medical device purposes. Some of those purposes are not medical device purposes. But regardless, um, in your impact assessment for your non-device functions, if if that non-device product has an impact on your medical device, there's a fit for purpose question um, that you're answering there. And whatever design framework that you use um, and however you align it with, you know, ISO 13485 or any of the other quality management systems that we have out there. Um, you need to be asking yourself that engineering question of whether or not what you're doing is fit for purpose. Do you I'd like to echo. Oh, go ahead, Clay. That was oh, really okay. Good. I'd like to echo what Brendan said is, is I think that, um, you know, you have to have it fit for purpose. And let's take it to the more simple, I, and this was part of our feisty conversation tomorrow, uh, yesterday as well. Um, you know, if you think about it, before software was around, when you were making medical devices and we had to follow the, the GMPs, well, when we bought our screws or we bought our printed circuit boards or we bought any of the components that went into those medical devices, we did not expect those manufacturers to have uh, the GMPs uh, uh, and be under the FDA regulation, but we did impose on them elements of what we expected to support the quality requirements that we needed to have the product work and function in the way we needed it to in our design. And so, you know, that's where there are requirements that you want to impose and you have to think about what is it being used for. So, just because a component or a sub module in either the hardware or in the software or in the firmware or any of those things isn't medical, you want to make sure that it's going to function effectively and, and support the intended use uh, of your ultimate um, uh, purpose. You know, from my from my perspective, the term design control light can be quite deceiving, right? And this is what where we got into this sort of feisty conversation is the this idea that there's a giant bell curve in what people do in commercial development practices, and if if you generally have a, a, a I don't even want to say state of the art, if you follow good development practices for software and you understand your software requirements, you understand your user stories you have some definition of the architecture, 
you have a test program, whether it's automated or manual, whatever, but you're doing some of the basic good development practices. And the gap between that and what would be necessary to create the documentation for a pre-market submission or create the, the supporting evidence for compliance with the QSR or ISO 1345, often that gap is small and might be zero, okay? But let's remember that there are also uh, companies out there whose development process involves little to no uh, definition of requirements, very light amount of testing or, or get even gathering objective evidence of the, of the result of the testing. So the, the, when I say design control light, quite frankly, I just am ref, referring to what I would consider to be base good development practices for commercial purposes. <laughs> okay. And if you're not doing that and you want to take your commercial product and add device functions to it, or, or it, it's close to a device and you, you add alarms, you add some real time monitoring, whatever, and it's going to trigger. If you haven't done the base, if you haven't done basic good development, there's going to be a big gap and a lot of rework. Okay. Let's just be clear because today, still in the today's world, a pre-market submission requires, it works off of objective evidence and documentation. So be smart, use good development practices, commercial good development practices. If you have the basic understanding of the requirements for the product, the architecture of the product and some objective evidence of how you've tested it and that it meets its intended purpose, you're a long ways. And when you move into the device space, it's not going to be gigantic, but if you have nothing, right. And you intend to continue to use, do, do little or nothing on your commercial products. If there's a chance your your a commercial product is going to morph into a device, then you probably need to embrace this concept of getting it at least to what is considered good development practice in commercial today. And I'll, I'll say design control light, but at the end of the day, it's this idea. We understand its requirements. We understand its architecture. We understand how it's been tested and how it performs. Okay. So that's where, that's where Brendan and I kind of had a discussion yesterday, right? Yeah. And, and I guess, Randy, one of the things I just want to reemphasize that I said in my earlier comment was it just makes good business sense. If you're, you know, it, it, you want to have good principles and good methodologies and good records and, and good documentation um, because it, it, if, if you're never going to make a change and you're walking away from it, maybe it's okay not to have those things. But I, I think most people are in business to have a continuity and to have continuous sales and do continuous improvement. And so if you don't have, from a good business practice standpoint, you want to have those things in place. And I think both Clay and, and Brendan have, have really said that a number of times when we've had our discussions. So. Yeah. It, it's, it's, there's a meme that went around in LinkedIn a couple of years ago. It was, I thought it was great. It got more likes than anything else I've ever seen. It said, I've often thought the most conspiracy theorists have never been project managers. I find their optimism to be adorable. And so it's a question of like, it's hard to execute on this stuff, right? It's hard to build a good organization. So is is it good enough if it, another unfair question you're going to reject the, 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 the characterization for, but I'll do it anyway. Um, if you, if you know, if you're, if you rate your development organization's maturity on a, on a school scale from A, B, C, D, E, if you're a B student, you know, if you have a B grade development department, is that good enough? Or do you really got to be A grade to be doing a responsible job here? Yeah, well, there you are again with your objective standards. Um, yeah. But I mean, it, isn't that already out there, Randy and Brendan and Clay? You probably know it better, but like the CMMI scale, you know, I mean, everybody goes for that and they do it in the software practices and, and you know, I, I, you know, I don't, I, first off, I don't know anybody that's at the A scale. I don't know anybody. And, and didn't NASA in some of their claims say that, you know, for every thousand lines of code, there's usually at least one error. So what's perfect? I think part of this question comes to a, a terminology distinction uh, that, that some people will make. You know, when you're thinking about QMS or QMS Lite, and when you're using those terms, to some people, um, those terms imply a difference in amount of bureaucracy. 
And to other people, those terms imply a difference in amount of development discipline. Um, and I, I think that sometimes that's the disconnect that happens when you get folks who have been doing commercial software development uh, encountering folks who have been working in the regulatory space and, and vice versa. And I think it's important to enter these discussions with some open-mindedness about the notion that there is, as, as people have said on this call, there's a, there's a curve out there, there's a bell curve. There are people doing commercial software development who are doing it phenomenally well from a development discipline and engineering discipline perspective. There are people doing medical device development who aren't. Um, there are people who are doing medical device QMS we're doing it phenomenally well from a lack of bureaucracy or unnecessary bureaucracy perspective. And there are people um, who are doing commercial development who, who are on the opposite end of that spectrum as well. And so this, this isn't about, um, you know, one of these work streams being an entirely different environment than the other. Uh, this is about finding the right balance of engineering and development discipline that results in products that are fit for purpose. Um, and it's it's about minimizing unnecessarily non un, unnecessary and non value added bureaucratic headaches, um, and that's common across you know all software development um, for any product that matters. So it sounds like you're saying if somebody's out there saying, "Oh, you don't understand med tech. We have a, a level of quality we have to meet that nobody else does." You might turn around and say, "No, Netflix pretty much has to meet that level of quality or beat it because they've got a global audience and." If, if the signal gets fuzzy on any given day, people are going to be upset because they're not getting their subscription. Yeah, they certainly have, um, you know, core functionality in their product that needs to be darn near bulletproof, if you will, right? Um, and and I think, again, that's that's where fit for purpose comes in. Not every, not every function necessarily needs to be operating at that level of resilience, um, but, but most uh, successful commercial entities do have do have software that they care that much about for good reason. I'm going to interrupt quickly for a point of order for the panelists. And I've never done this before. We're getting some really good questions, but frankly, it would take me so much time to try and synthesize them. You know, take two or three into one. I'm going to invite you all to browse the questions and and pull answer them in directly, or or if there are ones that a couple that you can group together, but um this audience is too smart for me, apparently. Usually I'm able to kind of skim and say, all right, we have three questions on this, but not this time. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, med tech is from Mars, tech is from Venus. You know, the very different languages. You know, they're, they're, they're this, as you're saying, some of the same principles, right? But But they don't speak the same languages. How do you bridge that in these conversations so you can have that that conversation you know okay we're not going to put the data warehouse for that will feed our future ai under a qms but we need to make sure it's being done well how do you have how do you def, how does the med tech person explain to the, the data warehouse person what they consider to be good enough in a way that they're going to understand yeah maybe you start with some questions you know um okay what does this what does this product do um, why, why do you know that you're doing the right thing, right, uh, in terms of meeting user requirements? Um, how do you know it works? And can you show me? Um, and I think those questions can go a long way to getting a lay of the land uh, and, and understanding where you are in terms of how big a gap there might be um, between what you're going to need uh, for the evidence that's going to be you know, required, whether that's for a device function, uh, if you're changing the intended purpose of, of one of these uh, commercial products, um, or even just for the evidence that you're going to need to support an impact assessment for integration with device functions. So I would start with those questions and um, be open-minded to, to the notion that there are different ways of doing this well. Um, and, uh, you know, we've got to do our work to, to map that back to some of the terminology that happens to be, you know, colloquial in the uh, medical device regulatory space. Beth, I know you've got thoughts on this. No? All right. Uh, Clay, all right. tell me you're reading one of the questions because I'd love to pick off a couple and answer them. Any you want to re could restate and address? I was actually just typing answers to people in the background trying to get some of them ticked off. <laughs> pick one you think would benefit everybody and let, let's tackle it as a group. So there was a, there's several questions about this idea uh, that we were talking about of, of 
a broad distinction between the system for commercial software and the system for medical device software. And I don't see it that way. And I think that's bad practice. I'll be honest with you. I think this idea of having an entirely separate development cycle uh, and development processes for commercial and medical device, I think it's unnecessary. And I, I think it breeds bureaucracy and inconsistency. I think a single scalable dev process that, that, uh, uses concepts like risk to 62304 does I won't I won't compliment 62304 a lot but I will say at least the idea that that you can risk classify pieces of software or software modules or functions and the system and scale development deliverables and processes based on that starting with at the low end of the spectrum isn't nothing right it's in my mind, it's good, it's good basic software development practices. And on the high end, high risk products, whether they're device or not, right? High risk, as you define them, should be subject to more stringent development practices, better engineering, higher reliability. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean more documentation either, by the way, right? It doesn't have to. This idea of right sizing what you produce is the right idea. It always has been the right idea. Um, so I am not a fan of this, like bifurcating commercial development and medical device development, single scalable, uh, dev practices, I think is the right answer based on so this. If an organization, a leader in an organization says, I'm, I'm really afraid to put my, my, my other stuff anywhere near the device stuff, because it's, it's so slow under design controls. It sounds like your response is, it sounds like you have a problem with your design controls. <laughs> Maybe, or maybe you aren't using basic good engineering practices for your commercial product. I mean, I've seen both, and this is the concept of it's a bell curve. Some people do it really well commercially and are, are way more sophisticated, and their products are way better than some medical device companies. But the opposite is also true. There are people producing products out there and, and software and hardware that are not very good. <laughs> and so you have to start with what's your baseline and and you know, I guess I'd make the case that do the thing that's right for the product and and where there are, and there are, there are a few regulatory hooks and things that we have to do that you may not do in a commercial environment, but like 90% of it overlaps and a smart person's going to scale what they do based on risk anyways. I mean, forget, for you still have product liability, you still have all these other considerations. So I don't know, I that's my, I that's fully my support product. what, yeah, I fully support what Clay is saying. I think the scalable process is is much better if you have good decision making processes to you, leveraging the risk element of it. I think the other thing that um, needs to be reflected upon is is that, um, and I'll pick on cybersecurity, which is not the software development stuff, but guess what? Medical was way behind other industries in cybersecurity for a while. And there's still some best practices that could be leveraged or at least understood to integrate those into some best into the practices. Um, I also agree with the concept of that it doesn't necessarily mean um, you're creating uh, thousands of pounds of records. I think that's where there also is that scalability element of it as to determine the when and the what to develop um, as evidence from your conformity assessment. Um, and I would suspect that, you know, if you look at something like Microsoft, I'm sure they've got tons and tons of records and tons and tons of documentation for what they're doing. And in many cases, maybe even more than a medical device company has. Maybe I'll, I'll jump in here and say, you know, Yes, you can have one scalable process. Um, yes, you can have separate processes for your device and non-device software functions. It is possible to do it both ways. Um, whether you're focused on you know, having separate models or well-integrated models, do make sure that you delineate um, which functions are medical device functions and which are not. Uh, do make sure that you document that for when the time comes, if you're going to have an inspection uh, from an FDA investigator, or if you are going to have a 510K or another regulatory submission to the FDA, your you know, lead software architect or whatever you call that person 
and your regulatory affairs professional should know each other's names and be good friends. Um, and early in the process, they should be talking about this strategically uh, in order to make sure that when it comes time to modify your product after it's on the market, you, you are clear on where you can move quickly and with less, um, less stage gates from the standpoint of needing to submit a follow on, uh, you know, pre-market review to the FDA, for example, um, and where you can't. And so coming to a common understanding of what's what early in the development process is very, very important for maintaining your agility down the road. Uh, so it's, I'm glad you said that because I was about to go to a question, which I think is um, poking at that a little bit. Um, it says the idea of segregating non-medical device functions from medical device functions has been thrown around a lot. But in practice, I find that most engineering teams can wordsmith any architecture to fit the quote unquote segregation threshold. Is there a concrete method or rig a rigor of segregation that FDA re reviewers expect, or is it better just to apply med dev design controls across the board? So that was actually my best attempt at answering that question. So uh, I'm I'm going to look to the other panelists now. I, I would like to say that um, you know, no, you should not have to apply the med device uh, design standards across the board. You should be able to do that segregation. And I think Brendan um, said it very clearly that that R that head of R and D, software development, whatever, and that regulatory person should be working together up front. That should be well defined as a strategy, well defined and well documented with rationale as to why you've made that decision. Because in my, you know, bazillion years of experience and multiple hundreds of uh, audits, both FDA and otherwise, if it's if you've got rationale, even if they don't like it. Um, I can say that uh, very rarely has there been big pushback. If we've if we've documented reasons and we've described why we're doing something, you know, uh, it, it, it's it it is implementable. But it's got to be in that close partnership and tandem. And I'm and I'm glad Clay is going to take it from there. <laughs> <laughs> well, Beth, I, I've had kind of the same experience. I've been, I'm one of, I've done submissions and and audits for my whole career, right? And um, separating in the same processes, same manufacturing. We won't just talk about software. There's hardware here too, device and non-device, and putting them in the same facility and trying to run them separately and not having clear delineation is difficult. It's difficult. Okay. So you have to you have to plan that well. Um, I, I I would also say be be very clear as Brandon said what your what is a device and what is not a device and what is it subject to because remember that multifunction device guidance document um, is about pre market submissions but it is possible to have uh, something that is for example five ten k exempt but not GMP exempt. Uh, not design control exempt. So you you may still have a product that you don't have to tell the FDA about in a submission, uh, a product function, I'm sorry, let's call it a product function, but still would require you to apply other QMS elements to the product, right? So this gets, this can get fairly complicated. And I would challenge anybody out there that's thinking about designing a product, a multifunction product, doing the architecture correctly, segregating all of this, and ask yourself, is it worth the complexity? Okay, always ask yourself that because there's al always a trade-off between the analysis that has to be done to show no interaction or an interaction, but with risk control measures versus treating it like we've traditionally treated it as a product and, and submitting it as a device. So. I've had great experiences with multifunction products in, in review with regulators, and I've had really tough ones where there's lots of challenges about the interaction, right? And the data that goes back and forth. Think about complexity. And this also goes to the two systems or one system, right? For the non-device and the device functions. Is it makes sense to maintain two systems entirely separate, knowing that at some point you may have to bridge across because now you've added a function to a non-device to make it a device, and now we have to bridge, okay? And if they're completely different, they take completely different approaches, is that a reasonable thing? 
and can it be done? Absolutely. But there, there is something to be said for single system simplicity, scalability, rather than multiple systems. Uh, and then going back to the original question you asked me, Randy, at the beginning is, is remember if you're going global, what your decisions are going to do in the U for the U.S. customers may be different for other jurisdictions. So before I ask, ask you a follow-up question, I do want to note it's 12.51 and we promised everybody we'd cover the core content plus some questions. I think we've hit that, but for anybody who has to drop off, thank you for joining us. We appreciate the time. Welcome your feedback. Welcome your questions. Welcome your suggestions for future topics. We haven't posted it yet. Our next webinar, March 14th, is essentially a how many birds can you kill with your one data stone? Um, can you can you basically define a, a, a data and evidence strategy that lets you simultaneously tackle uh, things you're going to need for regulatory approval, reimbursement approval, and provider buy-in, market adoption down the road. Um, so, all right. So, Beth, let me let me go back to you on this because we we we've, we've talked about the international context. We've talked about multi-function uh, devices from the FDA. Do other jurisdictions? Do other countries have a concept similar or that differs from a multi-function that you have? Do we have to to contend with? Um, again, my favorite term, it depends. Yes. Um, <laughs> yes, some of them do. Some of them, um, they want uh, recognize things like software as, a, a, you know, software as a medical device. Some don't. Some, it's the software and the hardware. Um, some, it's, it, 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 nothing is constant, I guess, other than change. Um, <laughs> Uh, so yes, they you know some do have the concept of the multi um, function, but I will say that you know the good news is is that um, some of the countries I've actually experienced with some of them. Uh, I'll pick on China as an example. Um, we actually had a Chinese reviewer that um, had a copy of the FDA's guidance and was asking us to explain how our product fulfilled that guidance. And ironically enough, it didn't buy because it was, but, um, you know, they were, they, they were um, very interested in better understanding uh, what the FDA's concept was in that. Um, I know that um, uh, some countries are still very much in their infancy of even figuring out what is or isn't a medical device yet. So um, that's why I say it depends. Sounds like what I'm not hearing you say is we have a problem of specifically different guidances around the same problem that are not harmonized and are actually leading us to, you know. We do have that. Like, Beth, Beth is saying it depends because we you find that. It, yeah. You know, it, it, you can see you can see any scenario of it's it's a class three device in this market and it's not regulated in another market. I mean, it, they, they are all over the place. And so have a global strategy of where you want to market this to the, to your, to the best you can, because yeah, the whole story of it's just going to be a U.S. product or it's U.S. and EU only, especially for larger companies, it never, it never works out that way, especially if it's. And even, even if you do U.S. and the EU, guess what? They're not harmonized. In, in, in that, their concept. And, you know, even in the classification of the devices, and I picked on the electronic medical record, but, you know, there were um, under the new medical device regulation, a number of products that the FDA wouldn't even think of regulating are now class 2B devices in, in Europe. Um, so, and then the recognition of the associated standards, how standards are done and how that gets integrated and what it, what standards they prefer to to recognize, whether it be the software development standards, whether it be AI, whether it be cybersecurity, they're all, you know, they all have those requirements as well that are that vary. They, they, they again, they all talk the same language and they all say that they sound like they're saying the same thing. But God forbid you try to. If I literally took my FDA's 510K or my, you know, or my technical file and tried to submit it to some of those other countries, um, they would have 10,000 questions because they wouldn't agree with which standard I chose. They wouldn't agree with which methodology I utilized. Um, uh, 
even classification of risk, like I said. So this is another case where experiences can run the gamut. Um, you know, ha having been in some of those rooms over the years, if if I heard a great idea from a, a counterpart um, who was me regulating medical devices in another country, and I wanted to implement it in the U.S., for example, and sort of drive harmonization or convergence that way, um, it's it's not like most regulators um, or technical experts can act unilaterally to do that. Uh, you you have laws in these various countries. You have you know all, all sorts of challenging complexity to deal with. Um, and so, you know, I do want to give credit where credit is due to these folks. They they do a great job of harmonizing on language and first principles um, and trying to take that as far as they can within the specific statutes that they're operating under, within the regulations that they have in place. And where the, um, you know, where the benefits are big, um, they tackle uh, those issues that are, um, you know, ingrained in regulation, for example. And I think we've got a couple of recent successes from from my colleagues, not from me, uh, you know, my former colleagues um, with ISO 13485 in the U.S., for example, the finalization of, of that rule recently. Um, just today, the International Medical Device Regulators Forum issued a document for consultation on risk characterization uh, for medical device software. And so if this is an issue you care about, um, it is incredibly difficult and complex. And also, there are really good people working hard um, to make incremental progress there, and in some cases to make you know big steps uh, with with things like those rule changes, statute changes, and other things. Um, so, so do get involved. Do provide comments on documents like the one that IMDRF posted today, um, and do help them prioritize their attention. Uh, but in in my personal experience, at least. I think that um, many international regulators see the good sense in policies and approaches like the one in the multiple functions guidance document. Um, what, what they need to become confident in is that you end up with a product and a medical device overall that is safe and effective in the context of its use. And that is in fact the point of this policy is to result in products that are safe and effective in the context of their use. But it does it a little bit of a different way than people might be used to. Um, and it's it's fair to give some people some time to, to work through that and see how it can be applied in the context of their specific statutes. Right, and I, and I would say, I you know, just looking at the FDA's history, at which you can find on their website, um, it, the 40 years that I, you know, remember 1976, when some of us were born long before that, um, medical devices were not regulated. You know, I, I remind people of that. In the old days, I used to be able to tell everybody in the room that. Now that's not the case. But, you know, I think that if you look at all the regulators, all the regulators, they are trying to work with all of the stakeholders to move forward, to progress, to learn best practices from each other. Um, you know, the FDA has the privilege of being the the regulator that's been around the longest, that has the most experience. You look at Europe. I mean, uh, Clay, you probably remember French homologation. Um, oh, you yes. know that we used to have that we used to have to do. You know, every country in Europe had their own way of doing things. The positive was they then went to medical device um, directive. The negative was then they all of a sudden mandated their languages. So, uh, you know, what you might have only had to do in two or three languages now, all of a sudden you had 16 countries languages you had to localize in, you know, so that nobody wants to lose complete um, control uh, for their country's regulations and and requirements. But I do think that there has been significant, you know, in the 40 plus years that I've been doing medical device regulations, that there has been significant um, working together, sharing of information, um, best practices, worst practices, you know, learning from the worst and, and the best, but we still have a long way to go. And unfortunately, I don't think I'll see full harmonization. Well, and, and for those regulators that are just getting started, I think that that's also, um, you know, an important important thing to recognize. There's there's a lot of existing uh, infrastructure that you can build on. Um, there's there's a lot of good out there that you can pull from. Uh, if, if you are, you know, just now starting to think about what what is your localities um, regulatory framework for uh, medical device software going to be, you're not starting from scratch. Um, and, and there's a lot that you can uh, leverage from other jurisdictions.
Agreed. I'm going to actually step into the panelist role for a minute because there are a couple of threads that were said before that I think uh, accentuate a really important point, which was um, a you want to have your 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 regulatory person and your your architect in the same room at the beginning, which also means that your architect's going to need to speak some regulatory and your regulatory is going to have to speak some architect. You can't just say, I don't understand that stuff. You're going to, you're going to have to be able to, 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 to learn a little bit each, of each other's discipline to be effective and understand each other's language. But then there was an interesting point made about, you know, the complexity of every integration you look at. And I think that brings up a broader project management point, which is ultimately when the regulatory expert and the architect come to an answer on how you do something, it should still probably go back to the person who owns the product decisions to say, okay, we can do it. And here's going to be the cost and effort because it may, just because you can do a cool integration doesn't mean you should do a good cool integration. You know, it may be, it may be that it's, ah, you know what, that was a nice to have, but when you're telling me what it is, forget it. We'll just, we'll take that out. It's, it's gotta be also a, a back and forth with the product team essentially. Because otherwise you end up with a runaway project with, with the people paying for the bills, not understanding why. And when they find out why being unhappy, that that's where their money is going. Some of it, I think what you're describing is, is in history, what we've done is, you know, make by decisions when, you know, you have to go to the business team and have that discussion so that you have to determine, you know, is it smarter to have a fully, you know, if, if you've truly got, um, consumer products. And, 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 you know, I worked for a company that did have true consumer products that were never going to be medical. And we had medical products. Well, those true consumer products, we did keep fully segregated. And that was a good business decision because at one point there was the concept of, oh, we're going to have only one quality system for the whole company. And needless to say, the consumer product group went, hell no, you know, you don't, there, we're never going to make this a, 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 and, and there's no linkage there. So, you know, I, I, I do think you have to obviously have those business discussions as well. I'm going to ask my panelists if there's any other questions you want to pick off the list, because I do feel like we've actually come to a pretty good place, but I don't want to neglect any interesting uh, questions that came in from the audience. Randy, there's one here that mentions brand management and quality management objects tied to the fit for purpose principle. I, I did not understand that comment. Um, I didn't know if any of the other panelists maybe had a thought on that one. Um, I didn't understand it either, Beth. Okay. Um, I think we've hit all the others. Um, so I think uh, any closing comments from all of you? Um, please do this. Please don't do that. <laughs> you can do this. Uh, that'll that'll be my closing closing comment. Um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, regulators want products that work well for what they're supposed to do. Um, and they want evidence that those products work well for what they're supposed to do. Uh, it's pretty simple. It gets you know complicated in terms of the jargon and things from there. But if you're a company that builds products that work well for what they're supposed to do, you can do this. Excellent. I, I love that comment about you can do this. I think that is is key. And I guess my add to that would be, but make sure you work together with all your stakeholders so that uh, you have everybody's input and perspective so that uh, you meet the business needs, you meet the regulators' needs, you meet the customers' needs um, in your solution. Choose your tools carefully, especially in software development. These, if you choose the right tools, you can make this so much easier on everybody. And if you choose poor tools that don't talk to each other, uh, it can be a nightmare. And I, I think that there are a lot of good commercial development tools out there that can support just what we need to do for device products. Um, but there are some that don't. So, so if you want to make this easier on your dev engineers, you want to get adoption of good development practices. You want to make documentation easier, pick a good set of tools, automated test tools. 
Any others? All right. Well, I want to thank our panelists. Uh, this has been a great conversation. I've been getting getting comments back from people in the audience saying great conversation, good discussion. We appreciate it. I'm looking forward to getting this up. I think we'll be uh, citing this a lot. Uh, again, send us your feedback. Um, you can reach out to the panelists directly on LinkedIn. I no longer have to get out an email. You can just shoot them a note if you want. And they they, uh, they can respond. Uh, thank you all very much. And everybody have a great weekend. Thanks all. Great weekend, everybody. Bye. Thanks.